Okay, ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to talk about the three Ayodhya debates concerning Ayodhya, the temple town in North India. There are three debates going on. One is about ancient times. Did Rama really live in Ayodhya? The second is about medieval times. Was there a temple? Did Hindus build a temple at the site? Did they treat it as did they treat it as Rama's birthplace? And if so, why did it disappear? And a third debate is contemporary, namely what should be done with the contentious sites at present. So was this Rama's birthplace? <coughs> well, frankly, I don't know. You see, none of us was present at the time of his birth, there are no witnesses. If there had been any writing about this, well, there is this much of writing. We have the Ramayana that says he was born there. Now, it doesn't give a map of Ayodhya. We're not even sure it was that exact location, but at least he was born in Ayodhya. But then you see, who knows? You see, it's only literature. Anyone can say anything. Suppose we go digging and find a plaque that says, here in this room, Rama was born on such and such a day. You see, that would raise suspicion, because mostly, you know, people are born all the time. And very rarely is it marked by a plaque or by anything that this particular person was born on this site. So that also wouldn't prove anything. So let's just accept we don't know if Rama was born there. And there's nothing wrong with that. We, we know he was born. I mean, if he was a historical person, and there are good indications for that, he is mentioned in the Puranic king lists, which in the Puranas is the most historical part. See, there are lots of stories in the Puranas, of course. But the king lists are the most historically sound part. He is mentioned. Uh, but so if he was a historical person, he was born somewhere. That's all we know. <clears throat> but then you see that claim is good enough, according to the Indian secular state. Why? Well, for example, they facilitate pilgrimages to Mecca. Now, why do Muslims go to Mecca? You see, in Mecca you have the Kaaba, which supposedly, according to Islamic tradition, was built by Abraham. That's what makes the place sacred. Now, is this proven? Do they have any witnesses about this? Is there any scriptural evidence? I mean, there was a claim made by Muhammad but that is thousands of years after the building was supposedly built. So that isn't worth very much. And yet the Indian state supports this whole pilgrimage. Until recently they even paid for it. But at any rate they facilitate it. And similarly now, as I speak, the BJP in its election campaign in Nagaland has promised the Christian population that it will finance, or at least partly finance, pilgrimages to Jerusalem, to the holy sites of Christianity. For instance, in Jerusalem you have the Holy Sepulchre Church. What is so special about the Holy Sepulchre? Well, Jesus walked out of it alive. And most people who are buried, well, they remain there or someone else digs up their body or something, but they themselves don't wake up alive. So if this happened to Jesus, that's quite special. Maybe I would like to go to see that place too. But then, does the secular state really support beliefs like that? 
Well, apparently, yes. In India, the secular state considers it its task to support beliefs like that. So if those things, if those perfectly irrational beliefs can be sustained, then certainly the belief that someone was actually born can also be accepted. So yes, of course, Rama was born there. Let's all agree that he was born there, though we don't know for sure. Was there a temple at the site? Well, archaeological excavations, especially by B. Bilal in the 1970s, had already shown that there was human habitation there down to the second millennium BC. Incidentally, that finding was not liked by many Hindu acharyas. Because you see, among Hindus, there is a belief in a very ancient chronology. You see, the Vedas, they supposedly already exist since the time of creation, if there was such a thing. And Rama lived 7,000 years ago, or 700,000 years ago, sometime long ago. And so this finding of human habitation down to the second millennium BC was a bit disappointing to them. And so Bibilal, when he was questioned, he said, well, you see, frankly, I don't know. Um, I don't say so. But my spade tells me so. My spade has been digging and has not found anything beyond the second millennium BC. Now, you see, maybe he hasn't dug deep enough. This, this may be stuff for, for discussion. But nevertheless, it proves that he was not biased, that he was not in the pay of the Hindu party. You see, he simply found what he found. And he affirmed what much he had found. So in his very objective excavations, we find that Rama could have been born there, a temple could have been built there. And then at a later stage, a temple is actually, or remains of the temple have actually been found. Then in 2003, there were uh, far larger court-ordered excavations that, uh, that dug up the entire foundations of the Hindu temple and many pieces of temple remains. So it is very sure that there was a temple there. Then why did the temple disappear? What is this mosque doing there? Again, we have no report. No report of that specific temple, at least. Because we have Muslim descriptions of how in 1192 to 1194, they destroyed temple after temple after temple. That is when they destroyed all the temples of Varanasi. That is when they destroyed Nalanda University. That is when they destroyed a number of temples in Ayodhya of which we do have more detail. Like there was a giant temple, a Buddhist temple, and so on, that have all been destroyed, that have been replaced with mosques, like the Shah Zuran Ghori Mosque, named after one of the Muslim generals at the time. So, If anything should be proven, it would be that this Rama temple got a special treatment by not being demolished. Because the rule was that all temples were demolished. So in the absence of any other proof, <coughs> it would still be safest to assume that a temple was demolished at that time. The Muslims themselves, of course, have made it worse for themselves by also testifying that this, uh, the mosque that was ultimately standing there, the Babri Masjid, was the result of a forcible replacement of a Hindu temple. In, in 1885, 
uh, a court case uh, was heard uh, before a British judge about this contentious site. And so the Hindus in the court case argued that uh, a Hindu temple had been demolished there by Babar, and we want it back. We want to build another Hindu temple there. And the Muslims said, no, 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 no. We have, we have uh, beaten the Hindus fair and square. We have uh, chased them from there, and we have built our mosque there, and we want to keep it. And so the judge said, okay, let's have a look. And he went to the place. He inspected it. And he said, well, I am satisfied to, uh, to find that, indeed, a Hindu temple was forced to make way for this mosque. But as it happened more than 300 years ago, it is now a bit too late to remedy this. So let it all just stand like it is. So all parties to the debate, including the judge, agreed that a Hindu temple had been forced to make way for the mosque, even if the verdict was that the mosque could remain standing. So this was a matter of consensus. European travelers, European administrators, including the judge, local Muslims, local Hindus, they all agreed that there had been a temple which was forcibly replaced with a mosque. Now, for a full understanding, we should understand why mosques tend to appear on the sites of destroyed temples, or churches, as the case may be, for example, in Damascus, for example, in uh, Grenada. Um, or in, uh, in Istanbul, of course, the Hagia Sophia, one of the biggest uh, mosques in the world, was originally a Christian church. So why do mosques always appear on the sites of places of worship of other religions? Well, that is because of the Islamic doctrine of iconoclasm. This doctrine says that all other gods except Allah are false gods. And they should not be worshipped. And anything that represents them is haram, is forbidden. In fact, even if you were to make a statue of Allah himself, that would also be forbidden. You are not supposed to depict gods. Neither false gods nor the real gods. So any form of idol worship is wrong, is forbidden. And therefore it is a virtuous thing to destroy idols. The classic precedent for this is the behavior by Muhammad and his nephew Ali when they conquered Mecca. They went to the Kaaba, which at the time housed 360 different idols. So they destroyed them with their own hands. And then they declared, truth has conquered. And so all the other Muslim iconoclasts in history, those at least who cared to justify what they were doing, referred to the precedent set by Muhammad. Uh, this is very obviously true. There is a whole literature that confirms it. Nevertheless, in India, the secularists hope that you won't read this and replace it with their own version, which is that there was no iconoclasm. Or, well, you see, in the 80s, 90s, they went very far. They denied iconoclasm altogether. Nowadays, they are a little bit more circumspect, and they are willing to allow that Islamic iconoclasm has destroyed about 80 temples in India. They, this figure they have from an American self-described Marxist, uh, namely Professor Richard Eaton. 
who says that he finds in history only 80 cases of temple demolition. Now, first of all, you have to read carefully. He says 80 cases. He doesn't say 80 temple demolitions. For example, in his list, you have the destruction of all the temples in Varanasi in 1194, and that is one case. So if you say 80 cases, it really means several thousands of cases. One case is a thousand temples destroyed. Okay. So the, the, the list that the, 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 the Vishwa Hindu Parishad is talking about of 3,000 or 30,000 or something temples destroyed, that is not very different numerically from the list that Richard Eaton uses. So you can call it 80 cases, but it's thousands of temples. Moreover, he says that this is not because of Islam, this is because of Hinduism. Because he has found a few cases where Hindu kings, just like pagan kings elsewhere in Mesopotamia, for instance, sometimes attacked each, other, each other's kingdom and then as a prize, you know, as a proof of victory, they stole the main idol from the main temple. Often idols were famous, were very beautiful, were often also adorned with jewelry and so on. So this was a prized thing. And so sometimes indeed they were stolen. But that is not at all the same thing as Islamic iconoclasm. Islamic iconoclasm is a symbolic kind of killing of the pagan religion. You destroy the image of the god because you want to destroy the religion. That is not at all the case here. Some Hindu king steals a Shiva statue. Why? Well, because he wants to worship Shiva in his own temple, in his own capital. And so he continues the worship of that statue. At the same time, in the temple of the enemy, where he stole the statue, well, he has perfectly no problem with the local people installing another Murti, another Shiva, and continuing the worship. So this is not at all a matter of destroying the religion. It's only a matter of stealing an idol. In the case of the Muslims, they didn't steal an idol, they destroyed an idol. They cut it to pieces, or one thing they did, for instance, was to... Um, uh, to work it into uh, the floor, into a lavatory floor, for example, to really dishonor it. Or, for instance, in the case of the uh, Umayyad Mosque in Damascus or the, um, the Kashi Vishwana Temple in Benares, they left part of the temple standing and built a mosque over it so as to demonstrate clearly that this mosque had been an idol house and that it had been so-called freed from idol worship. In fact, the Babri Masjid itself is an example of this. There were a number of pieces of temple architecture present in the mosque to show off their victory over paganism. In fact, you have specifically the case of Aurangzeb. There is a whole industry among Indologists to whitewash Aurangzeb. It already started with Patabhisi Taramaya, who was a, a friend, a lieutenant of Mahatma Gandhi. You see, he, he talked about some wild story uh, that Aurangzeb destroyed the Kashi Vishwanath temple because the local priests had abducted a girl and he wanted to liberate her, and then he wanted to punish the priests by destroying their temple. So this is just a wild story, nothing to it. Um, then, you know, you have Audrey Troshkan and a whole number of contemporary Indologists who glorify um, Aurangzeb. In fact, I've sat in on uh, a session in the European Association of South Asian Studies annual conference um, in Zurich, 
where one scholar after another was coming to study and to present his findings about one writer after another living at the time of Aurangzeb and glorifying Aurangzeb. Well, I am very sure that if you study the literature written at the time of and in the neighborhood of Joseph Stalin, you will find many eulogies in favor of Stalin. No doubt. You see, if they valued their life, if they valued their career, they had better stay friends with the men in power. And so this is what happened around Aurangzeb too. For example, one character witness in favor of Aurangzeb that they mentioned was Guru Govind Singh. Now, Guru Govind Singh, later in life, was a man completely on the defensive, completely with his back against the wall. He had been militarily defeated by the Mughals, who had first martyred his father, Teg Bahadur, and then had killed all his four sons. Now, just diplomatically, he had an interest in staying friends is perhaps not the right word, but, you see, having a reasonable relationship with the powers that be. So he wrote a letter to Aurangzeb, the Zafarnama, the victory letter, in which he tries to sound diplomatic and conciliatory with Aurangzeb. And so that is used by these Indologists as proof. See, see, even this religious leader, uh, Govind Singh, even he was in favor of Aurangzeb. Well, you see, I, I don't have to be an Indologist. I could just simply be a village bumpkin and yet see that this is nonsense. You see, everybody knows that there was no one in the world whom Govind Singh hated more than Aurangzeb. Why? Well, Aurangzeb has, had killed Govind Singh's father and his four sons. There is no one else in the world who had done that to him. So it is very sure. I don't have to study any local uh, or contemporaneous writings and so on. I know just from afar, and everybody in his right mind knows from afar, that this man hated Aurangzeb like anything. And yet, all these Indologists in parade, you see their findings, oh yeah, you see, even he testified in favor of Aurangzeb. Well, what can I do? You see, the determination to whitewash these iconoclasts is indeed enormous at the moment. However, uh, the um, Historian K. and Pandita has um, translated a biography by one of his pupils of an Iraqi Islamic preacher, Al Iraqi, he is known as uh, the man from Iraq, um, who converted Gilgit and Baltistan, which is a, a part of Kashmir nowadays in Pak occupied Kashmir very thinly populated, very inhospitable. But even there, even there this perfectly uh, pro-Islamic witness already lays down that there this, uh, this preacher has demolished far more than these 80 temples that supposedly cover the entire uh, harvest of Islamic iconoclasm in thousand years in the whole of India. Moreover, he clearly gives his reasons, namely he refers to the example of Muhammad. He does not say, oh yeah, some Hindu king stole some, stole some uh, idol of Shiva and therefore me, now I am destroying all these temples. That is not at all there. Instead, his justification is the precedent set by Muhammad. So this is so obvious, you see. The, all these attempts by secularists or by India watchers to whitewash this iconoclasm, when all is said and done, and when the time has passed when there is a political reward for these lies, 
You know, they will all just be the butt of ridicule. They are so transparent. So it is very certain that there was a hostile replacement of a temple by a mosque. However, and now I may disappoint some Hindu uh, viewers, when that happened is not so certain. You see, everybody says 1526 by Babar or by his lieutenant Mir Baki. But in fact, that is not so certain. The first time that Ayodhya was occupied by Muslims was by Salar Masud Ghaznavi, the nephew of Mahmoud Ghaznavi, who occupied Ayodhya in around 1030. He was defeated in 1033. Now, very probably, he was the first one to destroy the temple. And so, the, um, the foundations that have been dug up are those from uh, a temple which in the records is called the Rajput Temple. There was a Rajput dynasty uh, in the 11th century. And they probably built that grand temple in replacement of the smaller, more modest temple that had been there before it had been demolished by Salar Masud Ghaznavi. But that is speculation of mine. I think it is very likely, but I don't know of any proof of it. Then Muhammad Ghori and his lieutenants conquered Delhi and the whole Ganga plain up to Assam in 1192 to 94. They destroyed all the temples that they encountered. They destroyed all the said uh, temples of Varanasi, they destroyed Nalanda University, Odanpuri University, and so on. They made a clean sweep of every sign of paganism they came across. Could they have allowed this major Hindu center of pilgrimage to persist? Moreover, Ayodhya was a, was a provincial capital of theirs. This means that the house of the Islamic governor stood like opposite of a major Hindu temple. Could they have allowed this for 300 years on end? And so... That temple built in the 11th century, was it still standing there when in 1526 Babar is credited with destroying a Hindu temple? Was that that same temple? That is questionable. The archaeologists are not, has um, dated the Babri Masjid to about 1300, 1300 something, early 14th century. Okay, suppose he's correct. Because personally, I don't know much about art history. I provisionally take his word for it. Suppose he's correct. So there was a temple there built during the Delhi Sultanate, still standing there when Babar came surviving Babar and standing there till 1992 when it was demolished by Hindu uh, activists. In that case, what could have happened? You see, what made Babar or his lieutenant uh, Mir Baki uh, make such a show of, you see, here I built a mosque. Did they have to build a mosque? Was there not a mosque standing there? Well, again, this is something we don't know. You see, if we really want to make history or find out the history of Ayodhya, that is, for example, a thing to find out. What exactly happened there? For example, a, a very probable scenario is that when the Muslim rule weakened, they made some compromise with the Hindus so that they could effectively use the site that effectively they could organize their pilgrimage there without actually demolishing the mosque that was standing there. So in that case, what Babar destroyed 
was not so much a building, a piece of architecture, what he destroyed was the Hindu use of it. You see, maybe just like between 1949 and 1992, when the mosque building was used as a Hindu temple, maybe that too was the scenario in the early years of the 16th century. Maybe that was the situation Babar found. You see, we don't know exactly. We know that in the few descriptions that there are, they always talk about Hindus. Hindus went there on pilgrimage even when a mosque was standing there. Hindus came from all over India on Rama's birthday to celebrate there. Even if there was a mosque standing there, they went as close as possible because this site was important to them. So was there actually a functioning mosque there is a question. So the first unknown is um, what happened at the time of Salar Masud Ghaznavi, 11, uh, 1030. So he was defeated in the Battle of Bahraj in 1033 by a Hindu coalition, an alliance uh, led by Sukhadeva and including the famous philosopher king Raja Bhoja. In fact, it's a, it's a great topic to make a movie about. Hindus always complain that they are not united. Well, you see, that was an occasion when they united and with good result. Now, it is very likely that while he was in control of Ayodhya for some three years, Salar Masud Ghaznavi did destroy the Ramzan Mabhumi temple. You see, it makes sense, but we have no proof of it. Then in 1193-94, again it is very likely that uh, people like Kutubuddin Aidbak, uh, Bakhtiar Khilji, or Shah Zuran Ghori, who conquered the whole Ganga Basin, that they destroyed this temple like they destroyed so many others. And if they left the Rama Janma Bhumi temple standing, it is very strange that they did not leave the Kashi Vishwanath temple standing, that they did not leave Nalanda University standing. You see, what would have been so special about Rama Janma Bhumi? I wonder. So if you say that the same temple that existed in the 11th century was still standing there in 1526 for Babar to demolish. What you are actually saying is that the Delhi Sultanate for 300 long years left a major Hindu temple standing in a place under their control. You see, that would allow a lot of religious tolerance to a dynasty that more than any other in Indian history has demolished temples. So that is a bit unlikely. Irfan Habib, a historian strongly in favor of the Babri Masjid, may be right when he says that there was a mosque standing there during the Sultanate period. And so I personally add the uh, supposition that maybe at the end of this period, Hindus used this mosque as a temple, just like they did in 1949 to 1992. So those things are unknown, or not firmly known. All that is known is that this temple fell to Islamic iconoclasm. And all relevant Islamic sources say so. And so even the demolition by Babar, we are not sure about, for the reasons I mentioned. Um, and it remains a bit of a mystery why they claim to have built the mosque if it had not been destroyed earlier. It's a question. 
the foundations all the time remain the same. They were the foundations of the earlier Hindu temple, but it is perfectly possible if you know a bit about architecture to build new buildings on top of the existing foundation. So perhaps some viewers will say that I actually exonerate Babar. You see that for them Babar is guilty of demolition, and I say, well, Maybe not. Now, persons to me are not important at all. Principles are. And so the principle of Islamic iconoclasm certainly is guilty for the demolition of this temple. And whether the person who actually ordered the demolition was Babar or Mir Baki or Salar Masud Ghaznavi or Shah Zuran Ghori or one of the other Islamic invaders is to me relatively unimportant. Just like Aurangzeb, you see many people get very personal about him. They say he was cruel, that he was a tyrant and so on. No, he was just a pious man. He was known to be a very ascetic. He didn't, he didn't enjoy the power he had. In fact, you see, he lived, he lived a, the kind of life of Mahatma Gandhi. You see, Mahatma Gandhi had his spinning wheel, and similarly, Aurangzeb personally made these white hats that uh, Muslims wear. And so, you see, this was his discipline, this is what he did. And um, so, he was a bit of an ascetic uh, as for his temperament. Like, for instance, you know, he could have enjoyed music. But no, you see, as a true Muslim, he thought, you see, music is haram. He was against music. He, um, he fired the court musicians. So that asceticism has the same source as his iconoclasm. Both were the result of his religious piety. He took religion seriously, therefore, since Islam commandeered him to destroy idols, that's what he did. And so, with his personal character, there is not much wrong. Well, although killing his brother for seizing the throne is perhaps not so sympathetic. But, you know, as kings go, he was not much worse than the others. The only problem with him was that he was wedded to an ideology that was more problematic. At any rate, there was a consensus over the pre-existence of a Hindu temple uh, where later the Babri Masjid was built. And so a British judge confirmed it in 1886. No Muslim concern denied it. And in the 1980s, the secularists could have adopted that same stance. They could have said, just like the British judge, okay, a temple was demolished to make way for a mosque. You see, that's sad. It shouldn't happen. But since it happened so long ago, it's just history. Let bygones be bygones. That is what they could have said. But they were so power drunk they were so sure that they could away, get away with anything that instead they claimed that there had never been a temple at the site. So, so far the question had been, can Hindus rebuild the temple at their site? But now the question became, ah, but was it ever a Hindu site to start with? Now in general, I would answer that question easily with yes, because Islam is not eternal. Before 700, there was no Islam anywhere in India. And so there was little else in India at that time except Hinduism. So yeah, I can confidently say, of course, it was a Hindu site. Anyway, so in the, um, in the strange world of the secularists, it was very questionable that this was ever a Hindu site. Now, in view of the contrary evidence, 
including the excavations by professional archaeologists showing remains of the temple, it was a bit reckless, scientifically speaking, to take this position that there had never been a temple. But you see, though they had no leg to stand on, they thought they could get away with it. In the power equation at the time, the secularists reigned supreme. And on the opposite side, they only saw this motley crowd of Hindutva people, of P.N. Oak and other so-called history writers, who didn't understand anything about the historical method, who had no intellectual self-confidence, except those extremists who made fools of themselves. And so against that, they felt very confident. They thought they could do it. They also saw that all these big time uh, history professors, Indology professors in Harvard, in Oxford, and so on, all just um, agreed with them and imitated them. There was none of them that raised his voice and said, no, you see, real history says that, of course, there was a temple there. So they really thought they could get away with it. It was a brutal expression of contempt for the Hindus. And so in 1989, as you know, the JNU historians issued a statement, the political abuse of history, in which they said that, that there was no temple there, there was no evidence there for a temple. And practically speaking, they wanted the Babri Masjid to be saved and to be declared a national monument. At that time, the issue was very politicized. It is in 1983, that a judge ordered the locks to be opened. That is to say, from 1949 till 1983, the place had been effectively a Hindu temple, in the sense that idols had been installed there, and a priest was allowed to go in to perform the ritual. Otherwise, the place was locked to pilgrims. Then in 1983, the court opened the locks. And so it became a regular place of Hindu pilgrimage. Only the architecture was still Islamic. But otherwise, functionally speaking, it was a Hindu temple. There was a lot of political recuperation uh, at the time. And before we start about the BJP, let us first highlight the involvement of Congress. Nowadays, Congress is a party of the minorities. It's usually anti-Hindu. It's only when they are with their backs against the wall that suddenly one of them writes a book, Why I Am a Hindu, uh, as Sashi Tharoor has done, or that they declare themselves um, a, a sacred thread-wearing Brahmin, as uh, Rahul Gandhi has done. Um, and so that's the traditional Congress trick of trying to be all things unto all men. But in the past, whenever they took a pro-Hindu stance, they were a, a lot more credible than today. At the time, Hinduism constituted a much larger part of their constituency. Whereas now, they truly are a party of the minority. And so in those days, it was very genuine when a number of Congress politicians took up the cause of the Ram John Mabhumi. Uh, this included a local politician, Daude Al Khanna, but especially the former interim prime minister, Gulzari Lal Nanda. And so you see, he was at the end of his career. He had nothing to lose, nothing to prove anymore. When he did this, he did it because he believed in it. He really wanted to support the Ram John Mabhumi, the birthplace of Rama. There was even talk of allowing Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi of Congress to lay the first stone of the temple. You see, that far they didn't go ultimately, but one of the cabinet ministers, Bhutta Singh, was present when in 1989, at 9 November, the first stone was laid. So it is not true that uh, this Ram Janma Bhumi movement was a BJP movement 
opposed by Congress. Congress initially supported it. But BJP more and more managed to pull this cause towards itself. So what Congress had in mind was the usual good old Congress horse trading. What they had in mind was to give the Hindus their little toy in Ayodhya and then give some, some goodies to the Muslim leadership in return, like banning Salman Rushdie's novel, The Satanic Verses, like the Shah Bano uh, legislation. So for them, at that time, it seemed like nothing unusual. They had done this horse trading so many times before. They would pull it off this time too. And so that would not have been very principled, but it has the virtue of saving a lot of lives. You see, all this rioting would have been avoided for years on end. Thousands of lives would have been saved. Now, the Congress lost its nerve after the JNU historians issued their statement in favor of the Babri Masjid. And it is very rarely that intellectuals have that much tangible influence on actual policy making. But so it happened on that occasion. And meanwhile, the BJP was um, moving towards grabbing the issue and catching votes with it. So in the Palampur resolution in 1989, the BJP claimed the issue, started supporting it, and started making sure that not the Congress, but the BJP was seen by everyone as the party that would build the Ramzan Mahumi temple. And indeed, in 1989 and again in 1991, it reaped the harvest growing from, what was it, four seats to 89, and then to 120-something. So twice uh, in a row, they won elections. And at the end of it, they were the major opposition party. From then on, India became a uh, two-party system, effectively, with the BJP and Congress as the two poles. However, if you look carefully, <clears throat> the BJP discourse at the time was nothing to be proud of. We're not very principled. <clears throat> First of all, it focused on Hindu sentiments. We will not allow the secularists to play with Hindu sentiments. You see, sentiments are not the issue. They could have claimed Hindu rights. It is a Hindu right to celebrate at a Hindu sacred site. Sentiments are what you appeal to when you have no leg to stand on. Then you can say, okay, you see, I have no right to it, but I'm so attached to it. Please give it to me. You know, but that is a miserable position to take. So they could have claimed it as their right, which it was. No, they claimed Hindu sentiments. They still do when I hear them occasionally. Then they focused specifically on this little toy in Ayodhya. They even gave up on the claim by the Vishwa Hindu Parishad for three Hindu sites, namely Ayodhya, Kashi, where the major Shiva temple had been turned into a mosque by Aurangzeb, and then Mathura, where the birthplace of Krishna had also been occupied with a mosque. So they wanted those three places back out of thousands of mosques built on uh, the sites of Hindu temples. And even on those three, L.K. Advani, the BJP leader, was willing to compromise. He would only have Ayodhya. Now, whether these three places, or even only one place, or all the thousands of places, at any rate, it was the result of Islamic iconoclasm, and what this Hindu move 
wanted to do was to remedy a little bit the effect of Islamic iconoclasm. Now, this problem of Islamic iconoclasm was religiously never mentioned by the BJP. They sidestepped the issue completely. And then another uh, escape route from facing this ideological uh, confrontation with Islamic iconoclasm was to make it an issue not between religions, but an issue of nationhood. They didn't say the Hindu hero Rama versus the Islamic invader Babar or the Islamic iconoclast Babar. No, no, they said the national hero Rama versus the foreign invader Babar. Now, that was a complete misstatement of what had actually happened there. You see, Babar's foreignness had nothing to do with this. The British were foreigners, and they did not destroy Hindu temples. The Greeks were foreigners, the Hunas, the whoever came first, they were foreigners, and they were not iconoclasts. Why? Because their religion didn't teach them iconoclasts. Whereas Babar's religion did teach iconoclasm. So they had to face this issue straight on and say iconoclasm is the problem, Islam is the problem. Now, the secularists say, ah, but that would have been revenge. And, and, and this was headlined everywhere, Hindus want revenge for iconoclasm that happened centuries ago. Look how narrow-minded these Hindus are. They want revenge. How barbaric. Now, revenge was never the issue. See, what was the issue was restitution. Give us back what is rightfully ours. Or give us back 1% of what is rightfully ours. You see, Hindus didn't make a fuss about all these thousands of other places, only three places. And those were places where the sacredness inheres in the site itself. You see, anyone can build a temple anywhere, but that doesn't make the temple as irreplaceable as those built on sites that are special to Hindus. Rama was born on that specific site, or so Hindus believe, and that site cannot be moved. A temple can be moved, can be taken apart and rebuilt elsewhere, but the birthplace is where it is. And so for the Hindus it is sacred because this is the place where Rama was born. So in that case, demanding restitution is not unreasonable. So, 6 December 1992, there was a large gathering in Ayodhya of Hindu activists, and there was also L.K. Advani going to give a speech. Uh, before that, the Supreme Court had promised to give a final verdict, but it had been dithering and postponing and postponing. And so the activists were impatient. But they were also impatient with the BJP, because the BJP, after reaping the harvest uh, at the elections, was not really doing anything about Ayodhya anymore. In fact, it had disowned the issue like a hot potato. But, you see, all the people had been gathered there and something was in the air. Now, a small group of people had prepared, technically, because demolishing such a building is not an easy thing. Also, you should know that the roofs of the Babri Masjid had been refurbished by the British early in the 20th century. There had been riots, the mosque had been damaged a bit, and so they had repaired it. So that roof was quite strong, it was in modern concrete. So you had to know something about the technicalities of building to demolish it. Now, a few people did give that technical lead. They had prepared, you see, brought uh, ropes and pickaxes. And then when they started, then the whole crowd fell in. 
and then very soon they demolished it. And finally they all took a stone home as a trophy. And so there was nothing left of the building. <clears throat> Elke Adwani was very embarrassed. He completely lost his nerve on the, on the spot. Ashok Singhal, from the supposedly militant extremist Vishwaindu Parishad, he appealed to the crowd to stop with his demolition. And he was threatened by activists. They took his dhoti and they said, we will pull it off if you keep talking like this. So the crowd was quite determined. And they, uh, they demolished the mosque. They were also allowed to do so because the police did not intervene. When the central government was briefed about this, led by Nara Singha Rao of Congress, it still did not intervene. And so, in fact, you could say that Nara Singha Rao allowed the demolition to happen. Politically, it was a serious matter because after that, there was a crackdown on the Sang Parivar. All the leaders of the RSS BJP were arrested. Four BJP state governments were disbanded. And this is after two central governments had already fallen over uh, this affair. The VP Singh government in 1990 and the Chandra Shekhar government in 91. So this had a serious political fallout. The great winner at the time was Nara Singh Rao, the Congress Prime Minister. You see, as a congressman, he put the BJP on the defensive. It was a great embarrassment for the BJP. But also as a Hindu, and he was a committed Hindu, far more than the Gandhi family, he achieved the demolition. That is no mean thing. Now, about his demolition. Was it a dishonorable thing to do? One thing that it certainly did is that it accelerated the solution. As long as the mosque was standing there, it gave Muslims hope of repossessing the site. It kept the whole conflict alive. In fact, Muslims had no stake in it. No Muslim ever goes on pilgrimage to Ayodhya, whereas millions of Hindus do. But you see, now this had been held before them like a carrot by the secularists. You see, please fight for this. You create some bloodshed on the street. You see, create fights between Muslims and Hindus so that we secularists, we can be, act holy and say, look at these religious barbarians. You see, this place should be made a national monument, secular. Well, you see, because of the demolition, um, Muslims mostly lost their appetite for it. Though in the short run, there was indeed rioting, rioting that emanated from the Muslim side, because that was the side that was angry. Let's not forget it. You see, these secularists, of course, pretended Hindus created riots. No, Muslims did. In fact, Muslims used the opportunity to start a whole new technique of terrorism. As you might know, there was some Muslim rioting. Then the Shi Husayna lost their patience. In Mumbai, they started some Hindu rioting. And then the Muslims really made a fist by the bomb attacks of 12 March 1993 where they set the pattern for all the Muslim terrorist attacks since then. They attacked at a number of different places in one city, namely Mumbai, where they made 200-something dead. And so that is the pattern that was re repeated after that time and again in London, in Paris, in Brussels, and so on. In Delhi, of course. Um, so, by demolishing the mosque, paradoxically, the, uh, the Hindu activists caused 
riots that killed a few hundred, but in the long run, they prevented riots that would have killed thousands. So ultimately, they saved thousands of lives. I wouldn't be ashamed of this demolition. And in fact, that is probably one of the reasons why Nara Singh Rao allowed this demolition to happen. It expedited the whole controversy. It moved the solution forward. Now, of course, with these riots, with this demolition that was, strictly speaking, illegal, uh, the secularists found a new focus. You see, they were losing the history debate. They had no leg to stand on. Of course, there had been a temple there. So they couldn't win the history debate anymore at all. But now they found a new focus. They could say, Ayodhya, oh yes, that is the place where Hindu activists performed this demolition and the Hindu leadership covered itself with guilt. And so after that, you get a whole discourse about Hindu guilt, about LK Advani's guilt. You had the Lieberhan Commission uh, finding out about his guilt. And you had the climb down by Hindu leaders like LK Advani himself called this 6 December 1992 the blackest day of his life. So there's a tribal about that that is still going on now, uh, 26 years later. And by now, LK Advani is 90 years old, but he's still a defendant in that court case. But there is also the trial about the um, Ramjan Mabhumi itself. That started in 1950. It is only in 2003, 53 years later, that the court ordered excavations were carried out, that we definitively know that there was a temple there. And the high court gave its verdict in 2010, which was then challenged and taken to the Supreme Court, uh, which is now hearing the case in 2018. One thing that happened during the trial is that the court heard the testimony of all the secularist so-called experts that had been apodictically claiming that there was no evidence, that there had been a, no temple there. Now, when they were on the witness stand, one after another broke down. They confessed. I'm not an expert, they confessed, I'm not a historian, I've never been to the site, I don't know archaeology, and so on. All the so-called experts turned out to be non-experts. They had only their own very strong opinions, but no scientific knowledge. Of course, you haven't heard that because all the secularist media have protected their uh, scholars from embarrassment. Their foreign allies give this total silence, but nevertheless, that is what happened. The verdict of the court case was that they divided the land in three pieces, ill-defined pieces, but at least to this extent that the actual site itself would go to the Hindus, and there they could build their Ramjan Mabhumi Mandir, though one-third of the territory would go to the Sunni Waqf board, to the Muslim party. Now, the secularists were thirsting for blood, and they hoped that the Muslims would start rioting against this verdict. But this the Muslims didn't do. They were hardly interested. And, of course, they were hardly interested because it is not their own pilgrimage site. They go to Mecca, or they may go to Ajmer, but they never go to Ayodhya. But all three parties, two different Hindu parties and the Muslim party, were all dissatisfied with the verdict. Each of them claimed the entire territory, so they went to the Supreme Court. And as I speak now, this verdict is still awaited. 
In 2017, Subramanian Swami approached the Supreme Court for a speedy verdict. But the court said on that occasion that civil society itself should broker a friendly agreement. Now, that is precisely the situation of the decades before. It has created so many riots. Now, what do you have a court for if it doesn't adjudicate in, in disputes. So that is their election of duty. But it was applauded by the secularists because it would again um, prolong the controversy. However, fortunately, that verdict was not definitive, so we are still awaiting the Supreme Court's definitive verdict. Meanwhile, there is this, uh, this trial against demolition that is still going on. About that, I would like to say the following. All people present at the site whom I know or whom I have interviewed confirm unitedly that LK Adwani was no party to it. He was surprised, he was shaken. The next few days he didn't know where to look. At one point he gave a statement referring, for instance, to the demolition of Hindu temples in Kashmir and, and asking, you see, why is there no commission about that and only about Ayodhya? That statement had been drafted by Arun Shauri. You see, at that time, LK Advani was not really capable of giving any lead. So the demolition had happened largely spontaneously for most of the participants spontaneously. Nevertheless, a technical mastermind had been necessary. And for me, it has not been difficult to find out. It was about an hour of asking around, of asking the people who had been there. And so I know the, um, let's say, the political mastermind as well as the technical mastermind. About the political mastermind, I'm 100% sure, but he's not alive anymore. About the technical mastermind, I have, yeah, there is some doubt. It's probable, but there I'm not entirely sure. Simply because my sources uh, may not have known themselves. Anyway, I call on them or perhaps on a person I don't know, but who, who really masterminded the whole thing. I call on them to come forward and say, no, LK Adwani didn't do it. No, the BJP le leadership didn't do it. I did it. I am not a lawyer. I don't know if this, uh, this case is time barred or if it is still uh, actionable. Uh, I think also that that is less important. As a French proverb says, la vérité est bonne, which means the truth is beneficial. It is good to speak the truth. So it is better that now, finally, we all come to know what exactly happened on Demolition Day. As for the solution of the whole controversy, I think that it is very easy and very simple. The um, history debate was won by the Hindus, fair and square. And if any proof was needed of this, you can compare the stance on the history debate by the secularists and by their allies worldwide in or around 1990 with their stance today. Today they completely look the other way. They keep the lid on this whole controversy. They keep the lid on the, the, the performance of their own experts in court. They certainly don't want to hear anything anymore about the scholarly controversy because they know they lost it. But so they could still say, yeah, well, this history happened, but we want to have you put this history behind brackets. Let bygones be bygones. The past is the past. Well, okay, I, I agree with them. 
Here, the secularists are right. We should let bygones be bygones. Okay? We should not let the decision concerning Ayodhya depend on what happened 500 years ago. Excellent. Then, let it be decided by the circumstances today. And what are the circumstances today? Ayodhya is a sacred site for the Hindus. Ayodhya is where hundreds of millions believe that Rama was born. Ayodhya is where millions of Hindus and not a single Muslim go on pilgrimage. Therefore, even a secular government, or especially a secular government, that wants as, as, as little, as few religious passions as possible, will decide, of course, let nature take its course. Let this side be a Hindu side. Let Hindus be control of their sacred side. Now, what in the world is more natural than that? Why go upstream against this? So, you see, those who advise us to let bygones be bygones, let, you know, let those people and let us focus on today, and let us therefore leave the side to Hindus today. So we should restore normalcy, we should put an end to this ridiculous controversy by leaving a Hindu sacred site to the Hindus. That is the solution. Thank you.